Project Lawful aka Plane Crash by Arwain, aka Eliezer Yudkowski and Lynn Tamande. Thread 1, Mad Investor Chaos and the Woman of Asmodeus. Episode 41. Keltham, in any case, now attempts to recount to Cheliax what he went through as a kid to learn about the basic concepts of negotiation. The first part of this would be handing out assorting jelly chips to children, as selected to guarantee that different children will have different preferences over them, but all will find those tastes and textures pleasant at all. Letting the children trade among themselves, which they usually do one-to-one -one and peacefully. Introducing the concept of a multi-agent optimal solution to the kids, which gives them a social goal they could be failing at, instead of just a few voluntary improvements to make among themselves whereupon they start yelling at each other to make particular trades for the good of the class. And then the older kids come in and remind them that, by the definition of multi-agent optimality, solutions like that should make all the kids better off, so you shouldn't have to force anyone to go along with trades leading there. How are the Chalaxians doing so far? Absolutely no yelling at each other to make particular trades for the good of the class. Say what you will about evil, it doesn't inculcate that particular tendency. Meritzel has made herself a multi-column tracking sheet. Six of them, actually, ordered by different things. Can everyone report to me their hypothetical reward preferences in, uh, negative wrist slaps? Imagine we'll settle it out at the end by giving out a number of actual wrist slaps equal to the reward. So there's no incentive to overstate or understate your reward preferences. Keltham wasn't expecting them to go off and immediately start setting up games to simulate the thing he was describing. Despite the absence of actual jelly chips, he'd sort of wanted to see if imagination would be enough. But he's not going to stop them if they do that. He draws the line at the wrist slaps, though. The point of positive rewards in this case is that there's an incentive to play the game at all, Keltham says. If you tried paying Dathalani kids in negative wrist slaps, they could avoid all the wrist slaps by not coming to class. It's like trying to buy shoes at a shoe shop by threatening to wreck the guy's shoe shop unless they give you shoes. Even if they did give shoes, the guy doesn't want to be part of the whole system then, and now they have an incentive to call the town guard. Okay, town guard, sure. And anybody else who sees that's how you operate has an incentive to poison your shoes and send you to the afterlife early before you come around to their shop. When you're trading things the other person actually wants, they want the whole system to stay in place, which is what makes stable equilibria possible. It's an important difference. I want the whole education system to stay in place, says Meritzel, baffled. It taught me to be a wizard. Wait, do Dathilani children just not go to school if they don't feel like it? Wouldn't that get you a lot of people who never learn anything, or at least never learn anything they aren't being bribed to learn? and never learn how to do things that are unpleasant for a long-term reward. Civilization goes to a great deal of effort to arrange things so that kids actually do want to go to school. Because Dath Alani kids are smart by your standards, and the grown-ups do not actually want to get into a contest with us about whether or not we can rig the school's boiler system to explode if we use a cunning plot with coordinated distractions. It doesn't matter that they would very likely win. They don't want to get into the contest with us. Ah, uh, with them. I mean, they do still have all sorts of security systems to make it hard to blow up schools because, you know, kids. But they're based on the assumption of fending off like three kids who want to see if they can, not 300 kids who all have the same incentives. Chelish kids do not coordinatedly try to destroy our schools, Meritzel says faintly after a while. Even wizarding kids, who are smart. It wouldn't even be hard with magic. You wouldn't need coordinated distractions, but no one would do it, even if you'd made a very bad mistake at school and were going to be disciplined. They did check. Taldor beats students for misbehavior, too. You don't have to. Be so nice to children they wouldn't ever occasionally wish their school was on fire. You just have to teach them enough discipline that even when they wish it was, they don't do it. Maybe if you're good and refuse to use any punishments ever. Carissa feels like she's kind of caricaturing good here, like if she said this to a paladin, they'd object that obviously they do punish people when appropriate. Then you have to bribe everyone all the time to just non-destructively participate in society because the... 
differential between cooperation and non-cooperation still has to be just as large and you're trying to do none of it with pain. Ioni Sala is starting to feel nervous, for the first time, about what exactly Lord Nethys might be working towards with his plans around Keltham. Well, it's not as if she has any other options. So, moot point, she'll go along with his goal, even if it's exploding Cheliacs or whatever. It's not like she has any friends here. Look, I get that Galarian is a poorer and more dangerous place, and that you cannot afford to have kids occasionally successfully destroying their school. You still want to treat children as miniature adults, right? So that they'll grow into adults with the right shape? When they grow up into adults, you don't want those adults sticking around places where they're being hurt, or tolerating the existence of systems that leave people worse off than if the whole system didn't exist. So you don't put children into childhood situations where their own incentive is to destroy everything around them, and all they lack is the power to do that. Chelish students are not incentivized to destroy their schools, even if they wouldn't get in trouble for it, because becoming a wizard is really valuable, says Meritzel. Their incentives are sometimes on the scale of their lives, not on the scale of that specific day being more fun than not fun, but that's how being an adult is, too. Do kids here already understand that when they're seven years old, five years old, by the time somebody understands and has integrated subtle incentives for their future self spanning decades, they're no longer a child. They don't need adults to guardrail their decisions anymore. I suspect there's some weird sticking point here that, look, sufficiently young kids do get slaps on the wrist. Civilization doesn't like it, I don't like it. But even Dathilan never figured out how to produce healthy adults, while never doing that at any point. There are elements of morality and personhood that humans just weren't designed to learn without experiencing small amounts of pain in childhood. But every time you set up a situation where a kid gets told that they need to do something, or else get slapped on the wrist, you also add some value to an investment account the kid gets access to when they're older, such that even if the kid was secretly an adult, in a kid's body, they would still be calculating a net benefit on being present for the whole transaction, to make sure the total interaction is still mutually beneficial, which means beneficial to them too, so that ideal kids wouldn't have an ideal incentive to escape their parents or destroy the whole system. Civilization goes on optimizing its heritage, and the kids keep getting smarter and more law-comprehending which means that you always check all the interactions with children to make sure that the system wouldn't fall apart if the kids started being more ideal intelligences than expected one year. And having to pay that amount to set up a potential wrist-slap situation reminds adults to check, every time, whether they really needed a wrist-slap there. I realize you can't afford any of that, but it is how civilization thinks. We don't want to build into the system a load-bearing assumption that our kids are stupid and weak, even if they are. It has occurred to most of the girls that ideally they should be learning Keltham's economics, not arguing with him about punishment so they nod gravely rather than trying to explain the dozen things wrong with that. The most obvious, thinks Meritzel, is that you don't actually want adults who believe themselves entitled to blow up any system that isn't serving them because then you end up like Taldor having a civil war every few years. The most obvious, thinks Tanya, is that kids can in fact run away and get eaten by wild beasts if they want, and none of them do, so they obviously think being around their parents is better than not that, which they're right about. The most obvious, thinks Gregoria, is that adults are still children, in Keltham's ontology, and the only real adults are gods. The most obvious, thinks Carissa, is that the fundamental system in which everyone is participating in is existence, life, and then afterlife, and that's so obviously wildly worth it that no possible specifics could matter. It'd be like trying to sell someone a plus-six headband of all three mental statistics for the price of an afternoon scrubbing floors and assuring them that you won't yell at them for missed spots. It doesn't matter. It's all nothing next to the magnitude of the gift they've already been given, the only reason they're even able to parse it instead of rounding it off to the zero. It is is because their minds are broken and they're very small and stupid. If a god were somehow born into a human child's body, they wouldn't care if they got hit in class or not. Human weakness isn't any particular nature of the bribes, but the fact they're required at all— 
and planning for more perfect agents would mean planning for agents whose thoughts were too big and vast to give this question a second's contemplation. Keltham notices that he's running across a class of external and internal subjective sensations that precedes learning something is horribly wrong with Galarian, and sets it aside, because he's allowed to take longer than two days to learn about all of the problems. At least the problems they're making no effort to conceal from him, which they don't seem to be doing here, what with having just volunteered all of that info. Anyways, they can play a pretend version of the trading game, if they like, so long as they don't try to literally pay in negative wrist slaps because no just no, that's the literal opposite of the larger point. Keltham checks their final result, and references it against the supposed ordinal preferences for the players. Does it look multi-agent optimal at a computerless glance? Meritzel has helpfully circled each trade and noted why it increases utility for each participant, and then written down possible trades from the final state and why they don't. If something's wrong, it's a more complicated error than that. The girls are in fact heatedly speculating, now, in whispers, about whether there are local multi-agent optimal maxima that aren't a global multi-agent optimal maximum. Right. Not actual children here. If there's such a thing as a local optimum in that sense, which isn't global, you ought to be able to produce a simplified example of it. Say, try constructing one with three players and three kinds of jelly chips, Keltham suggests. There's not going to be, Meritzel says. If there were, and we knew what it was then, we could just switch to that arrangement. It could be better for someone from their starting point, but not better for them from the place we just arrived at, and higher value total. If it's higher value total and they get a veto, we use some of the higher value to pay them. Oh, I see. Do we have continuous jelly chips now? Keltham must have forgot to mention that feature of theirs. Would you care to state exactly what is a local optimum? and how it differs from a global optimum. Take like water, says Gregoria. Water flows downhill, but if it flows into a crater or something, it's not going to go up in order to get to keep going down. And water usually isn't sentient, and even when it is, it's not very smart, but you can have a situation where everyone agrees that the current situation isn't as good as some other situation, but none of them have a step that's a clear step up for them. And Meritzel is right that if you have centralized control, you can just make everyone go to the new place, even though there's not a series of smaller, mutually beneficial steps to get there, and also that if this involves some people losing out, you can pay them. But that doesn't always work. Like, for example, if you're dividing things that come in units. This comes up in spell structures. Comes up all over all of reality, including in the basic elements of the human body that the tiny spiral instructions say how to make, which fold up into configurations of least local resistance in order to have the kinds of material properties that they do. I'd guess that spells were the same way almost as soon as I heard about them. Anyways, I agree that's a good metaphor, but if you could have a very simple arrangement of three players with three jelly chips of three kinds, what would you say about that situation, which made it a local multi-agent optimum, and what would you say about it that made it a global multi-agent optimum? It's a local optimum if there aren't any trades anyone can make that leave both parties to the trade better off? And it's global if there are no possible states of the jelly chips that leave all three people better off. And can you prove that a local not global optimum is impossible for three players, each with one jelly chip, of three different flavors? Proving something for a simple special case is often easier than proving it for the general case, and sometimes is a good start on a general proof, if the problem hasn't been selected by some sadist. That is not what the Dathalani word troll means, but okay, fine. Anyways... Proving it impossible for three players with three jelly chips might be a start on proving it impossible in general, and in fact, there would be a lot of really interesting other proofs you could derive from that one. Asmodia doesn't feel particularly driven to succeed in class today, but... I have a chip Meritzel wants more than hers, but I don't want her chip more than mine. Meritzel has a chip Paxty wants. Paxty has the chip I want. We can do a three-way trade, but no two-way ones. Sadist she mentally completes. If they're continuous, you can make that work. With partial jelly chip trades. They're not continuous. Continuous doesn't help, says Asmodia. Merit Cell wants my one chip, but without Paxty, she doesn't have anything I want. Moving fractional chips around doesn't help with that. Not unless there's continuous players, like every possible mix of Asmodia, plus Merit Cell plus Paxty. 
Some students scribble in their notes for a little while until they are satisfied with this. Asmodia, who is of course still pretending to be cheerful and energetic, will have enthusiastically written out the example. Asmodia, has a banana, prefers apple over banana over cherry. Merit cell, has an apple, prefers cherry over apple over banana. Paxti, has a cherry, prefers banana over cherry over apple. Asmodia wants Paxti's cherry. But Paxti doesn't want Asmodia's banana. All right, on to the notion of non-one-to-one -one trades and quantitative indifferences. New game, but instead of just saying that you prefer some flavors to others, you say things like, I'm indifferent between having three apple jelly chips and four banana jelly chips. This opens up the possibility of trading jelly chips in a non-one-for-one -one way. Anybody want to try playing that game? If they're running quick simulations? This seems like it makes it much harder to get stuck, but no one has an impossibility proof yet. They do not seem to have noticed the fairness problem, or they're writing down different possible trade outcomes, but not with any sense that some of them are more desirable except subjectively. Keltham quietly hands Meritzel a folded-up note, telling her to try to end up with as many chips as possible for herself, in the course of suggesting mutually beneficial trades to the others. Well, all right, then. The other students do notice this. You recorded five to seven as the canonical one, but it could be four to eight, too. Guess you should be the one writing it down, Meritzel says. Paxty, seven blue for nine green. Give me ten. You have recorded that you like green only nine percent less than blue so I'm offering you nine. You have it recorded that you like blue a third more than green, so... But I'm not offering you ten. Carissa, six blue for four red. Is that allowed? Is what allowed? Are you allowed to not make trades that your utility function says you'll take? In this game? Well, you did it first. You turned down seven for nine. Carissa, six blue for four red, or if you make it five red, I'll throw in refusing to trade with whoever your least favorite student is. What if it's you? Done and done. Give me five red. I promise I won't trade with myself all day long. Gregoria, 12 red for 13 green. Am I allowed to change my preference weightings? Obviously not. Keltham, am I? Definitely no. Gregoria hands over 13 imaginary green. Meritzel turns around and hands eight of them to Tonya for blue. She looks supremely in her element, and she's talking several miles a minute, withdrawing any trades the other girls don't agree to instantly. You would think they would somehow teach kids about this sort of principle before they let them have investment accounts, let alone allocate years of training to wizard school. Keltham will wait until they have ended up in a multi-agent optimum, one of the many possible multi-agent optima, which happens to have a lot of imaginary jelly chips in the possession of Meritzel, such that, indeed, it is not possible to make all the students, including her, better off by taking some of those away from her and looking for a more evenly distributed optimum. It takes a while because Meritzel refuses so many trades, but they get there eventually. Keltham shall now observe to them that, if Meritzel has twelve green and prefers two blue to three green, and Gregoria has twelve blue and prefers two green to three blue, then all of the trades, five green for seven blue, six green for six blue, and seven green for five blue, are mutually beneficial, but differently divide up the gains from trade. There's a lot of different ways for jelly chips to be arranged, such that they can't be moved around without making at least one player worse off. For example, Meritzel could have all the chips, and nobody else could have any. Then any other way of arranging the chips will make Meritzel worse off. So that's one of the many possible global optima. Different paths through the mutually beneficial trades will take you to different global optima. So long as all the trades are mutually beneficial, you won't end up worse off than if you never traded at the end. But you might end up much worse off than if you'd traded more carefully. Keltham is a bit surprised that they didn't more quickly see the way in which this game resembled real life, since they seem pretty good at mathematical comprehension of the sort of structure that this game has in common with real life. But that will come with having more than one day's practice with parsing up games and real life into the pure abstract structures and simple mathematical properties they have in common, with parsing up real life as a shadow of law, that is then recognized at once when incarnated in some much simpler game. All of what Keltham's saying makes sense to them. Ione wonders, in the back of her mind, 
if there's some way to actually go between worlds that way, by understanding real life as an instance of law, and then sort of going through that law to end up in a different instance of real life. You know what? She's going to stop thinking that now. Thinking things in the back of her mind has gotten her into enough trouble already. Well, now that they've seen the problem of dividing gains from trade in a simpler form, re-encountering it as a more mathematical structure, have they got any new ideas about how to decide how many blue jelly chips to accept for how many green jelly chips? It depends what the other person will accept. You want to be keeping the books, Meritzel says. Then everyone knows you'll be doing the most favorable trades you can, and if they don't want to trade with you, they're just out of luck. Or have some other kind of asymmetric reason you can say, I'm holding out for better, which they can't. They could, in fact, have mostly stopped trading with you, and traded with each other instead, until the game was almost ready to end. And even then, if you'd tried to make trades too sharp, they could have just said no, and offered you more even ones. And if you refuse those trades, well then the game ends without being multiplayer optimal. Even if you make your mutually beneficial trades very slanted in your own favor, people can't end up worse off from trading with you compared to if they didn't trade with anyone at all. They can end up worse off by trading with you compared to if they'd traded with other people instead. So they walk away and find other trade partners if you try to capture too much of the gains from trade for yourself. This, too, is a lesson with a mathematical structure that appears in both this game and in real life. Sure, but it's costly to go around trying to find possible trade partners. In practice, if you own the books, you get the bulk of the gains from trade. Then some book owners are going to really lose out once Keltham figures out cheaper roads and bicycles. So Keltham thinks, but also Meta thinks fast enough not to say out loud. He is not quite sure of his larger social situation, and maybe he is better off quietly not pointing out certain winners and losers just yet. Dothilan has some excess wealth beyond bare living needs, and, now that Keltham thinks about it, probably a much more structured investment scene, which a hundred thousand annoyed customers can easily use to pay the startup costs of a new company that makes whatever you make, and contracts to sell it more cheaply for the first ten years to its founding customers so I'm the only trade partner around, does play less well there. If he emphasizes the part with the vast wealth Galarian won't have for a while, that'll maybe sound less threatening to anybody reading these reports, compared to if they realize that Rhodes will apply the same market pressure. Does Cheliax have a lot of places where, say, there's only one seller of food? Not food, because outside of cities, everyone grows their own food, says Tonya and lots of them bring it to the city to market. Only one shoe seller, though. And even cities might have only one fifth circle wizard who can cast teleport for you, or one fifth circle cleric who can raise dead. Well, I can see how the fifth circle wizard could end up quite wealthy that way, but surely a shoe seller must be much wealthier still. After all, while most people probably don't use teleports, everyone needs shoes, and the shoe seller can charge whatever they want for them. You don't have to have shoes, says Tonya. I bet the fifth circle cleric wants shoes, though, so maybe the shoe seller can set shoe prices incredibly high and capture all the money the cleric got by raising dead. Well, if he can raise dead, he can also cast mending on his own shoes, or buy them secondhand off someone else, or go disguised so the shoe seller thinks he's just a random laborer. Yes, people often do have a lot of other trades they could make, or other people they could trade with, if somebody else tries to capture too much of the gains from trade. You want to give them some incentive to stick around and keep playing the game. Sure. The shoe seller mostly picks his prices, but he doesn't have absolute power or something. Absolute power. A simple two-syllable word in Taldane. Does he not? He can just put up a sign saying the price is now a hundred million billion gold pieces. Nobody can stop him. The costs of finding some other solution are high, but they're not that high. He gets to capture almost all the gains from trade as long as the gains from trade are smaller than the cost of going to the next town over or something for a cobbler. But in practice, they are. So he gets to capture almost all the gains from trade. All right. If that's really true, I'm now a bit confused. If I imagine how much value everybody in a town gets from having shoes compared to not having shoes at all, it seems like it should be an amount more than ten times greater than the amount to set up a new cobbler's business. And how is the cobbler capturing most of the gains from trade when he's selling shoes to the cleric, who might be deriving 10,000 gold pieces of value from being able to wear shoes at all? 
The cleric buys his shoes in the city when he gets called into the city on important cleric business, says Tanya. And how would you set up a new cobbler's business? You don't know how to make shoes. And if you tried, he'd just lower his prices until you starved and then go back to raising them. Okay, so you don't actually have the thing where everybody getting ripped off would pool some money, start a new cobbler in business, and refuse to buy from the other guy for a while even if he lowered his prices. Pool what money, says Tonya. The money that everybody in an entire city would have otherwise needed to buy overpriced shoes. Twenty households in a village. The poor half haven't got any savings. The rich half have a couple of family heirlooms they'll sell if it's a drought, and a healing potion for if the woman's dying in childbirth and the cleric's out of town. And they don't even use it if the baby's dying. No one's so rich to use healing potions on babies. Keltham closes his eyes for a second and reminds himself that afterlives are a thing, and you can talk to the people in them right now. It's not like the babies are being cryo-suspended. A village that size shouldn't have its own shoemaker, then, unless shoes wear out really fast. You buy shoes in town when you go there to sell whatever you make, or the person who buys whatever you make in the village brings shoes over to sell when he travels to pick it up. Or am I wildly off base on how that would have to work? That is a town, twenty households. Twenty families is a relatively large group house. Pretend I just said city instead of town, then. Tanya shrugs. I don't know how it works in cities. Shoesillers compete in cities, Meritzel says. But eighty, ninety percent of Chelish people live outside the cities, Carissa says. It's true in Taldor, and she looked up whether it was true in Cheliax, too, because it might be an important difference if it were different, and Cheliax keeps but doesn't publish statistics on that, and it's also true in Cheliax. No, I mean, does a town of 20 households have one person who's a shoemaker? Yes, says Tonya. He doesn't only make shoes. He works in the fields at planting and harvest time, just like anyone who can walk, and tans leather for the shoes, but also for anything else you want leather tanned for. But yes, the town has a shoemaker, because it's too far from a city for people to go there for shoes. People farther out come to the town for the shoes. And this person is much richer than everyone else in the town, because he can charge whatever he wants for shoes? Serious question. I am actually trying to grasp how Galarian works here. No. He can charge whatever shoes are worth to people, but that isn't enough to make him rich, because no one else has much to spare, so shoes aren't worth all that much to them. He's richer than people who have to buy shoes from him, mostly. And then he just gets spread out more ways because more of his kids live. Unless he kills some, but Tonya has learned they don't do that in Taldor. I have a sense that there's some breakdown of communications here, and I hypothesize that maybe it's a missing concept of consumer surplus as distinct from usual market prices being what defines gains from trade. As we would put it, the consumer value to you of shoes isn't the amount you'd usually pay for shoes like that in a market. It's the amount you'd pay not to be forever forbidden from wearing shoes ever again. If there was some powerful anti-shoe magic otherwise about to afflict you, and you had to pay a fourth circle wizard to counterspell it before it took effect. In Dath Ilan, we'd usually expect the consumer value of an item to be noticeably higher than the selling price. The distance between consumer value and selling price is the consumer surplus, the amount of the gains from trade that goes to the consumer. The market price of shoes should settle somewhere not too far from the costs of making leather and going to cobbler lessons, not settle at nearly the absolute maximum price that anybody around would pay to be allowed to ever wear shoes again. So people are noticeably better off because of shoemakers existing at all, rather than being only a tiny bit better off, because the selling price of shoes is so astronomical that it cancels out almost but not quite all of the real benefit that people get from shoes. Or, that's how we'd expect it to be in Dathilan. If there were some powerful anti-shoe magic about to take effect, you'd still only have enough food to maybe make it to spring if you're lucky, and nowhere near enough to pay a fourth circle wizard for anything, says Tonya. She's not sure this is a productive argument, but she's pretty sure it's not a revealing one. I want to ask about a generous fourth circle wizard who offers to cast the anti-anti-shoe spell for just one gold piece. But I'm guessing you'll say that towns settle into an equilibrium where nobody has a gold piece to spend on anything. Because if they did, one more of their kids would have lived, and that kid would now be eating more food. This unfortunately, makes it harder for me to define the concept of consumer surplus around a counterfactual, 
willingness to pay any more. So suppose instead I tell you that consumer surplus is the amount that people would be sad if shoes stopped existing. They would, on the one hand, be happy never to pay for shoes again. But, on the other hand, they would be even sadder than that, because the shoes were worth more to them than what they paid. We in Dathilan would expect people to be a noticeable amount of sad, rather than just shrugging, because they were only barely in favor of paying for shoes in the first place at standard shoe prices. All right. I think people would be a noticeable amount of sad if the cobbler died. They'd say he was a lousy man, and they don't miss him, but they'd be worse off, and not just barely. And then that town never has a cobbler again, and the surrounding farms who came there to buy shoes just never get shoes again? I mean, is that what happens in real life when a cobbler dies? Keltham is confused by the part about them saying the cobbler was a lousy man. He notices the confusion consciously, then sets it aside. I mean, usually he'd train his son, but... I was imagining if he didn't train his son, so people figured, who knows if we'd ever get shoes again, or just have to make our current ones last forever. So there's, like, lineages of cobblers, each of which trains a single other cobbler to replace themselves, and if a cobbler dies out prematurely, all of Cheliax has one less cobbler lineage in it. Where did cobblers come from originally? Wait, are shoemakers a particular kind of non-human? Keltham is increasingly confused, but that makes it all the more important to follow wherever this is going. No. He can take some other apprentice if he wants, but since it's good work, he'd probably rather train up one of his sons. And there's certainly not enough money for two cobblers, so he only trains one. In the city, probably cobblers take more apprentices. And the town that lost its cobbler doesn't just invite in a new cobbler from the city, now that there's an unserved market there, because... Why would anyone want to move to a village in the middle of nowhere? Why was the original cobbler in a village in the middle of nowhere? Does Galarian, in fact, have market equilibria? He was born there. If cobblers live better lives in cities, he could move from his village to the city. If cobblers don't live better lives in cities, why wouldn't one be willing to move to the village? People don't like moving? Okay, Galarian has some kind of problem I don't even know how to describe right now. I check my current guess that we are not talking about just shoemakers here. This is also shirt makers, and basically everything else. Affirm? Spinning and weaving and tailoring everyone does at home, Tanya corrects him. But, yes, affirm that it's much more general than shoemakers. What's spinning, and how would you do weaving or tailoring at home at your current technology level? To make fabric, says Tanya, you shear a sheep. Then you clean the wool and card it, and then you use a spinning wheel to turn it into thread, and then you put the thread on a loom, and then you stitch it to make clothes. These people are supposedly very poor. Where did they get all of this individual machinery for their personal house, instead of having one machine time-shared among the whole village? It's not much machinery. And you want to be spinning all the time, pretty much. Whenever you aren't planting, you wouldn't make nearly enough thread if you were sharing it around the whole village. Where are they getting the power for this machinery? The town is on a river, and all the houses are along the river, and they all have water wheels that capture the motion from the water to turn the... spinning wheel? You turn it with a pedal. I think that we should perhaps get back to the fundamentals of economics as applied to negotiation, so that I can sell Cheliax the general and specific arts of making more efficient machinery. If you wish to support this AI reading and others like it, please visit patreon.com slash AI. Any help is appreciated. And thank you to executive producer John Doe 7776059.